All right, turn in your Bibles this morning to the book of Matthew. We're going to be in the book of Matthew today. We're going to be in chapters 27 and 28. The book of Matthew, chapters 27 and 28. And this morning, I'm going to ask you to use your imagination, okay? We're going to get a little creative here this morning. We're going to imagine, if you will, we can get into a time machine, and we are going back 2,000 years. And here we do, we find ourselves, it's, it's Friday night, and we are in Jerusalem. And why are we in Jerusalem, you ask? Well, just like any other good Jew... We have traveled to Jerusalem at this time to celebrate the Passover. And if you listen to the message or were here a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the Passover being the celebration of when God got the or delivered the Israelites from the bondage and from the slavery of Egypt. And what God had said was that you were going to sacrifice a lamb, not any other lamb, but a young, perfect lamb. And you were to take that blood and you were to put it over your doorpost and put it on the, on the side of your door. And when I come that night, I will pass over the, 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 those who have that blood on their doorstop. And those would be the Israelites. But all the other folks that didn't have that blood covering their door, I would take their firstborn son. And that was a judgment that came upon Egypt. So, here we do. The week that Jesus was crucified was the week that all the, all the Jews had come into Jerusalem to celebrate that Passover, that Passover feast. So I imagine when we just celebrated Passover, we ate, we ate the dinner, and, and we get back to our hotel, if they had hotels back then, maybe the, maybe the Holiday Inn, if you will, right? A nice, nice place. <laughs> and you settle down, and you're taking a shower, and you, and you turn on the news. You turn on, let's not call it CNN, let's call it JNN, Jerusalem News Network. And you turn it on, and this is the first thing you hear. The guy comes out and says, breaking news, breaking news. The king of the Jews is dead. Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph the carpenter, the self-proclaimed son of God, he's dead. He was crucified as a criminal today outside of the city gates on Calvary. He and three other men in total were, were crucified. You see, the episode started early in the morning when a trial started, but it ended with Jesus being crucified, and he was uncharacteristically buried in a tomb of a rich man. Because back in the day, you guys know, those folks are usually, after they're crucified, they're normally burned or discarded, the body's discarded. But this rich man, Joseph of Arimathea, took the body and buried it in his tomb. But this isn't unlike what's been going on, because you guys know in the audience that this has been crazy. This whole week with Jesus has just been crazy. Shouts from the crowd came as he was crucified. You could hear people saying, if you are the Son of God, come down from that cross. Or, he saved others, why can't he save himself? But in unrelated news today, Jerusalem experienced a free three hours of darkness. Three hours of darkness and a crazy earthquake. In fact, this earthquake, it destroyed much of the temple. A significant earthquake caused considerable damage. Some claim it was related to the unwarranted claim, uh, killing of Jesus of Nazareth. But experts are saying it's nothing no more than just the earth doing what the earth does. Mother Nature doing what Mother Nature does. Well, folks, in my audience tonight, looks like all this I am the Son of God... And I and the Father are one. All this stuff Jesus spoke is just plain lies. Fake news. That's what it is. Jesus is dead. The charade, the charade is over. Let's move on. The chief priests and the scribes were right. He could save others, but he could not save himself. Good night from Jerusalem. So can you just imagine that newscaster signing off that Friday night? And then you go to bed. You wake up, you do your thing on Saturday. Saturday was the Sabbath day in those days. It was the day of worship. 
today. Now it's on Sunday, the day of the risen Lord, but then it was on Saturday. So imagine after you do all you do on a Sabbath day, you go back to your holiday inn, you, you slide back into bed, you hit the remote, you turn on the, the TV, and same newscaster comes on, and he says, happy Sabbath day. Everyone able to take a breath and get back to normal? Stay with us tonight as we have a special for you. The special is called Back to the Boat. We'll find out what those followers of Jesus intend to do now that he's dead. Where are they now? Where are these followers of Jesus now? Are they hiding out? Are they embarrassed? Are they upset? Well, I'd be upset, upset too if I was taken for a ride like they were by the greatest con man in history, that Jesus. These once anointed fishermen of men will now have to go back to being commercial fishermen. But first, we have reports. You can see him just putting his finger in his ear, right? Hold on, we got reports that the Jewish and Roman authorities met to secure the tomb of Jesus. You see, rumors have been circulating that the disciples may steal the body. So, in order to improve this resurrection, you know, just Jesus was saying he was going to rise from the dead, so they've got to seal this tomb. To prove that Jesus was the Son of God. So let's go to our reporter on the ground. And you can see him, you know, going to the reporter on the ground. And, and they go to this reporter and, and he says this. He says, thanks. You see, the next day, that is after the day of preparation, this would have been on Saturday, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate. And they said, sir, we remember how that imposter named Jesus said that while he was still alive, after three days... I will arise. Therefore, in order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal away and tell the people he has risen from the dead, and the last fraud will be worse than the first. So Pilate said to them, You have a guard of soldiers. Go and make that tomb as secure as you can. So they went, and they made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. And you can see him saying, looks like there's going to be no funny business here. They're locking that tomb down. No one is going to get to that body. No one is going to get to that body. And he says, back to you in the studio. And you can imagine going back to the studio. And then the guy, the main, uh, the main reporter says, well, we can't be too careful these days. We don't want any funny business. And now to our special tonight, back to the boat. What are the disciples going to do now? And then you could have watched that special or you could have dozed off to sleep. And you go to sleep that night thinking, well, I've got to get back to my, my normal job. I've got to get back to home and uh, I'm going to have to get up early in the morning. But I may turn on that Sunday midday news. You know, you, that Sunday midday news. So imagine it's, it's Sunday morning and you turn on the television. It's about noon and the scroll across the bottom. You know, you've seen that, the thing going across and Breaking news shows up on the, on the TV. It says, the tomb of Jesus of Nazareth is empty. The tomb is empty. The body of Jesus is missing. What happened? Where's the body? Who stole the body? We will get to the bottom of this. Our earthly reports this morning are coming in. Our early reports are coming in this morning that the Jewish religious authorities and the soldiers who guarded the tomb, they say indeed that the disciples have stolen the body. The disciples have stolen the body. However, first we're going we're gonna to go back to our reporter on the ground. Our reporter on the ground, he's, he's right down the road from where the tomb was, and, he, and, he, and he's hooked up with two people. One is, her name is Mary, Mary Magdalene, and, and the other, it's... It's, it's Jesus' mother, Mary. And you can just imagine this reporter going, can, can we talk? Can we talk? And the lady's going, yeah, we, we can talk. And he says, ladies, what has happened? Who, who took the body? <laughs> no one took the body, the lady said. He has risen from the grave. It's a miracle. He said that this would happen, and, it, and it's happened. And the reporter would say, okay, well, well tell me what's happened. Here's where I read from 
chapter 28, verse 1. I could just imagine Mary Magdalene saying, Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of this morning, I and Mary, Jesus' mother, we went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, another earthquake. Y'all say that one earthquake was just a, a natural thing? No, it happened because Jesus was on the cross. And now there's been another earthquake. And for an angel, the Lord descended from the heaven and came. And the angel rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards, the one that were supposed to be guarding this tomb, they fell like dead men. They fell out. They passed out, whatever. They weren't guarding the tomb any longer. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus, who was crucified. But he is not here, for he has risen, as he said he would. <coughs> then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going to go before you to Galilee. There you will see the risen Jesus. See, I have told you so. So I departed, and, and my mom departed, and we quickly ran from the tomb with fear and with great joy. Can you imagine fear and great joy? And we ran to tell the disciples. And behold, Jesus met us, and he said, greetings. And we came up, and we took hold of his feet, and we worshiped him. And then Jesus told us, do not be afraid. Go tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there I will see them. I can imagine Mary and Mary saying, we saw him. I touched him. I worshipped at his feet. He is risen. I can just imagine the reporter going, well, back to studio. And the guy in the studio going, well, this sure is a doozy. Never seen anything quite like this. Who do we believe? Where's the body? Was it stolen? Or did Jesus actually rise from the grave? And is Jesus truly the Son of God? I guess that's left up for our audience to decide. And I can just imagine the newscast going off. So that's the question that I ask each and every one of you this morning. It's the question that's caused so many people sleepless nights. It's the question that all men and women from eternity past to eternity future who will ever live on this earth and children as well are going to have to answer. <coughs> what happened that Sunday morning? Who do you believe? And be careful to be quick to answer because your answer has eternal consequences. It has eternal consequences. Because remember, the fact is that Jesus actually lived. Jesus is a historical figure. Two, the fact is Jesus was actually killed. History shows that he was killed, he was crucified on a cross. And here's the third fact. The third fact is this. They never found the body. No one has ever presented the body of Jesus Christ. You say, why is that important? Well, this passage of Scripture gives us only two options of what could have happened that Sunday morning. Number one, the body was stolen. Was the body stolen? Did the disciples actually steal the body and hide the body to try to prove that Jesus was the Son of God? Or did Jesus do exactly what he said he was going to do? And did the Father raise him from the grave? Because if you believe, number one, and you believe the disciples stole the body to come up with this concocted plan to try to win favor with who knows who, then as Paul says, we will just live for today, we'll eat, drink, and be merry, because tomorrow we die, because we have no hope. But if we believe, number two, that Jesus actually did raise from the grave, and the reason he did it was to pay the penalty for our sins, and that we could now have a relationship with God, a relationship with God that has been severed, but now has been brought together through the blood and the raising of Jesus Christ from the dead. If we believe number two, 
then we all have hope. Amen? Because here's the deal. The world, unbelievers, the world wants you to believe option one. They want you to be misled. And they want you to question the miracle of Jesus Christ being raised from the grave. Because let's real quickly look back at chapter 28, verse 11. You heard me in my little newscast say that the disciples stole the body. But let's see exactly what happened and how did that rumor start. Because after Jesus had risen from the grave, in verse 11, it says, While they were going, while the disciples were going to see Jesus, behold, some of the guard, the guard who were guarding the tomb, went into the city and they told the chief priests all that had taken place. What they did, they went to the chief priests and said, We've got a serious problem. You've put me in charge to guard the tomb. I mean, we had this big stone in front of it. We sealed it with all this, like they would take a, they would take a melted wax and then they'd put rope on it, like strings on it, so that it would, you know, if you broke it, then it would, it would show that it was broken. So they had this thing sealed. And this, this stone weighed hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pounds. And these guys, are, they're coming to the chief priest and saying, you ain't going to believe this. But the stone has been moved. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a submit sufficient sum of money to the soldiers. The chief priest said, here, take some money. And you know why they did that? It said, tell the people his disciples came by night and stole Jesus away while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, the governor in, in Rome, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the, the, the soldiers, they took the money and did as they were directed. And the story about the disciples stealing the body, verse 15 says, has been spread among the Jews to this day. It was a clear cover-up. It was a cover-up. You see, rumors had been getting around that Jesus was saying he was going to rise from the grave. The Jewish authorities did not want this to happen, obviously, because the Jewish authorities had a lot of power. They were the religious power at that time. They surely didn't want Jesus to be the Son of God and be who he said he was going to be. The Romans surely didn't want him to rise from the grave because Jesus was claiming to have a greater kingdom. And Rome was the kingdom of the day. And if Jesus had risen from the grave, his kingdom would be greater than their kingdom. So you got the Jewish authorities and you get the Romans. They surely wanted Jesus' body to stay in the tomb. So they got this big stone, they sealed it, and they put these guards out front. And here we have, after Jesus' body is no longer in the tomb, these guards running to the Pharisees, running to the Jewish authorities, saying, help a brother out. Because <laughs> if this gets out, that I fell asleep or Jesus' body got stolen while I was on, on duty, I'm dead. They're going to kill me. And that's why the chief priest said, here, take some money, go tell people the disciples stole the body, and if this gets up to the governor, your boss, 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 we'll take care of it. The disciples stole the body. So that's what's going on here. And that's what the, that's what the world wants you to believe. They don't want to believe that God performed a miracle to have Jesus raised from the grave. They want you to believe this fake news. Chief priests, all the Jewish leaders had a serious problem with the body going. The Romans did too. They wanted to get back to normal as quickly as possible. They wanted to squash this. They wanted to find the body. And they would make every single excuse they could until they found that body. And let me ask you this. Was it possible that the disciples could have stolen the body? No. It's virtually impossible that those disciples could have gone up and been like, hey, Roman soldiers, look over there. And the Roman soldiers would be like, what's going on? And those disciples roll that stone away and get to the body of Jesus. It would have never happened. The guards were too strong. They had it too sealed. And think about this. The disciples, the follower of Jesus, the 12 disciples, all but one, John, died believing that Jesus had raised from the grave. 
All of them died for the fact of believing that Jesus was the Son of God. Some of you may say, yeah, people die all the time for causes. People do die for causes, but people don't die for a lie. People, all, all 11 of those disciples that died a martyr's death for believing in Jesus did so going to the grave saying, he is the Son of God. I saw him after his death. If it was a lie, one of those folks would have at least said, okay, I give up. I'm just kidding. But it didn't happen. In fact, when you read through the book of Corinthians and the letter to the Corinthians, Paul says Jesus not only showed himself to the 12 disciples, he showed them to five, 500 other people saw him right. while he was on the earth. 500 people saw him raised from the grave. Physically saw him. <coughs> And I love what Paul says in that letter to the Corinthians. He says, hey, and many of those people are alive. Rodney, you want to go talk to them? Go down the street and talk to them. They're still there. Don't believe me. Go, go talk to the 500 brothers and sisters you saw. Them. So was it possible that the disciples stole the body? Absolutely not. The truth is this. And that's why we're here today. Jesus willingly gave up his life for us. Jesus willingly went to the cross. He suffered on the cross. He died on the cross. And he was raised from the grave three days later to pay the penalty for our sins. And not only just to pay the penalty for our sins, but to go so that we could come into a relationship with God. A relationship with God that we were not able to get into until Jesus died. Because our sins had separated us from God. And the cool thing is, is Jesus just didn't die. So often we say, well, Jesus died for our sins. And we, and we forget that he rose from the grave. We forget to say that. Because the fact that he rose from the grave means that, that one day we will raise from the grave Amen. as well. And we will spend eternity with him. Now we can go to God. And we can go to God when you leave here today. And if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you can go and you can get on your knees and you can say, Father, and you can talk directly to God. Amen. You can talk directly to the Father because Jesus Christ, the death on the cross and him raising from the grave, has given you that opportunity. And you say, how does that work? What do you mean? Because in Romans 10, it says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord... And you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Amen. And what does it mean to be saved? It means that you are now into a relationship with God that will never end. Amen. You have access to the creator of the universe. You have direct access to his throne. You have direct access to prayer. And he will never pluck you out of his hand. And the cool thing is, is when you're saved and you have that relationship with Jesus and you say, I cannot do this any longer. I, I turn away from my sins and I want to have a relationship with you. God, he takes the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God comes and lives inside of you and helps you each and every day along the way. God doesn't leave you. He doesn't save you and then go off and save somebody else. He saves you, but then gives you the Holy Spirit of God to live inside of you. He didn't stay dead. God raised him from the grave to defeat death. Buried with him in baptism. Raised to walk in the newness of life. So if the skeptics, if the atheists, if this world is right and there is no resurrection, then this is all a lie. I'm just going to be really, really, really blunt. If Jesus did not rise from the grave, this is all a lie. Actually, Paul, when he writes in the book of Corinthians to the church in Corinth, he says, if Jesus did not rise from the grave, our faith is useless. He said, your preaching is useless. And he says, we should be pitied among all people. The fact that we dressed up and came here today to worship a lie. That's what he says. If the resurrection is not true, you're worshiping a lie. You're talking lies. But if it is true, 
which it is, then we have hope, y'all. We have an eternal hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Skeptics have had 2,000 years, 2,000 years to prove this wrong, and they haven't. They've had 2,000 years to produce evidence that Jesus did not raise from the grave, and they have not. That's why with confidence and with boldness, I can stand before you and open this word of God as an imperfect man. Like I said, you want a perfect preacher, you ain't got one. But I'm in the struggle with you. I'm struggling each and every day as a brother in Christ. Trying to be more like Christ each and every day than I was the day before. Bearing your burdens as you bear mine. But that's what it means to be a Christian. As we look to Jesus Christ, the perfect word, the perfect God. Because, indeed, he did raise from the grave. So what do we do now? What do we do now? Well, first we celebrate it like we do this morning. But two, we go tell others. We go tell others. And that's what's so beautiful about the end of the book of Matthew. Because Jesus then ends up meeting his disciples verse 16 it says, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw Jesus, can you imagine? Just imagine for a second your bestest, 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 bestest friend. Think of your bestest friend in the world, your BFF. And imagine they die. And you're extremely sad. Three days later, you see that person raised from the grave. Can you imagine the shock and the awe, but the ex just sheer jubilance that you would have to see this person? And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. Some were still like, hey, what's going on here? This is not normal. But then Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. All authority in heaven and in earth has been given to me. And he said, go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And listen to what he says. This is a commandment to all of us here in this church. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And he says, and behold... This is beautiful. I am with you always to the end of the age. The grave could not hold Jesus down. Jesus willingly went to the cross because he had a purpose. God had a purpose. The purpose was this. Man had a sin problem. Woman had a sin problem. We all are born into a nature of sin. You don't have to teach a baby to lie. You don't have to teach a baby to steal, do you? No, it's inherent in their nature. They just know. Hey, who here's had a kid that's been able to manipulate yet at an early age? Right? You didn't have to teach them to do that, right? What do you have to teach them? You have to teach them to do good, right? You see, we're all born with a nature that has a sin problem. And God so loved the world that he wanted each and every one of us to come into a relationship and then spend eternity with him that he said the only way that I'm going to be able to rectify this sin problem is for me to come and die in their place. Because the wages of sin, the payment for sin is what? Yeah. It's death. We will die for our sins. We not only physically die, but we would spend eternity separated from him. So God's problem was now his solution. And he came, and he came, and he came, and he took our place. The Son of God, the eternal Son of God, was born in a manger. Grew up to be 33 years old. Grew up just like these lovely kids here. Probably drawing in the synagogue, writing pictures or whatever. You know, playing in the playing in the in the ball fields, whatever they did back then. He was a little kid, grew up to be 33 years old. But it came that Passover week. And can you imagine the agony that he was dealing with? 
He rode into a donkey on that Sunday morning before. They were yelling, Hosanna, Hosanna, and they were taking palm leaves and celebrating him as the king of the Jews. But they didn't understand what was going to happen. And all week he was teaching parables. He was, he was running around doing different things in Jerusalem. And then it came to Thursday nights where he had his dinner with his disciples. And that's where he had the Lord's Supper. And that was the night he was betrayed by Judas. And it was late that night that they went to the Garden of Gethsemane and Jesus prayed. And he got on his knees and they said he prayed so hard it was like drops of blood that were pouring out of his body. And the soldiers came and they, they arrested him that night. They took him away early in the morning, had several different trials, and it was really, really early in the morning, about 6 o'clock in the morning, that he stood before the authorities. And by 9 o'clock, roughly 9 o'clock, he was on the cross being crucified. For six hours, he was on that cross. They took a spear and they poked it into his side to make sure that he was completely dead. And they had to take the body down because they couldn't, surely couldn't hang on a cross going into the Sabbath day on a Saturday. So a rich man by the name of Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea said, hey, I'll take the body. And they're like, no, we just ditch him over here in this pile over here. And he's like, no, you're not going to treat this man like this. You've already done enough. I'll take the body. And he had a tomb and they put him in the tomb. I can imagine that Saturday was agonizing. Agonizing for Jesus' mother. Agonizing for Jesus' followers. His naysayers, his opponents were just celebrating, right? He's dead, he's dead. Fake news, fake news. But that Sunday morning, that Sunday morning, that tomb was empty. And that's what we celebrate. Don't ever forget it. This is a day of, a day of we celebrate with our families, a day we get dressed up and we look good in our Sunday best. But don't forget today before you rest your head on that pillow tonight to thank God for sending his son, Jesus Christ. Amen. To pay the penalty for our sins, but then to love him so much to raise him from the grave. So now we serve a loving, eternal God who knows your hurts, who knows your weaknesses, who knows your inner thoughts. He knows your thoughts even before you have a thought. Scary thought, isn't it? <laughs> but he does. But if he knows that, then he also knows what's best for us. And let me encourage you today. There's only two options to this book and to what happened 2,000 years ago. We either accept it or we reject it. We believe that Jesus Christ truly was the Son of God and he is now living because he was risen from the grave. Or we believe that this is all a farce and this is just for a bunch of goody tissues who want to live a holy life. I'll go with the previous one. I'm going to say this is the word of God. Amen? Amen. And I'm going to believe that Jesus Christ actually is a risen Savior. So you say, how do I be saved, Steve? How do I get this relationship with Jesus Christ? How do I go into this eternal relationship with God so that one day when I close my eyes forever, the Bible says if, if I'm a believer in the Lord, when I close my eyes forever, to be absent from the body is to be what? Present. To be present with the Lord. Victoria, you are so good at this. <laughs> to be present with the Lord. And how did you get there? Everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame because you've confessed with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you've believed in your heart that he's been raised from the grave. Verse 11 says, for everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. Verse 13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen. And verse 17, I love this, this faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Why did he die? Why did he raise? To allow us to come into a relationship with him. Are you looking for a relationship with God today? And you don't know how to come into that saving relationship with him? It's real simple. 
confess. Confess your sins. Admit that you're a sinner. Confess that Jesus is Lord and you are not. Believe in your heart that you've been raised, that he would have been raised from the grave, and Jesus will save you. What was impossible for the world was possible for God through the cross. Are you looking for a relationship with Jesus Christ today? He's there, he's willing, and he's able. Amen? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for this awesome Sunday morning. God, I thank you for this body of believers. I thank you, I thank you God, that we come and, and we fellowship and we love each other so much that we will take time to play with the kids and, and such, but at the same time, God, we come and we, and we get down to serious business, and, which is your business, and that's why you got us here today. God, you're the God who created all things. You created the heavens, you created the earth, you created the trees, you created the air, you created us. All of creation is in response to you, and we are part of that creation. So we can either respond to you or we cannot. And Father, I pray today that everybody in this room, within the, the, the hearing of my voice, is willing to stand up and say, Lord, I am with you. You are my Lord and Savior. God, work mightily in the lives of the people in this church. Work mightily in those who could not be here today. Father, bless this church. Bless this community. Bless these families. Bless these these husbands, bless these wives, bless these grandmothers, these grandfathers. Father, bless these children, bless the single people. Whoever is in here today, whatever, whatever walk of life, Father, we find ourselves in, you are there with us. You're no, you don't pass any judgment. You don't look at the color of our skin. You don't look at our bank account. You don't even look at our past sins and say, you are not worthy of me. You look at our heart and you say, if you have confessed your sins and you believe I'm Lord and you believe that I've been raised from the grave, I will make your slates clean. And God, I thank you for that because my slate was extremely dirty. It was filthy. And you made my slate clean. God, I love you. I praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Turn to page 430. My what?